so good morning everybody. Uh, I'm Thea and I'm a postdoc in uh, Alessandro Marcella. And as he was saying, today I will try to give you some information based on my experience okay, about the optimization of specimen for uh, fluorescent microscope. Um, uh, but I want to start with a very short story, okay? about uh, a little scientist that was getting excited for my prospect, and it was me, and uh, doing my bachelor uh, degree in Bologna University. And it was 2008, and uh, we were in the plant uh, biology department, and we were collecting flowers from the botanical garden, and we were cutting the flowers, and I was staying with I don't remember what, and uh, I was uh, looking at the samples with uh, a microscope that uh, I don't remember which kind of microscope, but I promise you it was a shitty microscope, okay? <laughs> and I was taking these images with my little camera that at that time was like not even so many pixels, but okay, fine. And uh, when I was looking inside the microscope, I was getting so excited. And I was thinking, wow, it's really cool. I can see, you know, like this. Few years later, I was in Uppsala for my master thesis, and I had my very first experience with fluorescent microscopy. And uh, I had just been told uh, this is the protocol, uh, enjoy, follow these steps, uh, go to the microscope, that's the microscope, this is how it works, uh, enjoy. And I, you can imagine if I was uh, overexcited for uh, this kind of, uh, of microscopy, I completely fall in love when finally I start working with, uh, with fluorescence, okay? And then, uh, since I was so in love, I started my PhD in Alessandro's lab, and uh, I was so lucky that he put me in a project that uh, was including many microscope analysis. And uh, as you know, you start your PhD and uh, things uh, start getting a little bit different. <laughs> okay? Uh, <laughs> The problem started arising in the samples. I was going to the microscope and there was no signal at all. Okay? Or uh, I was going to the microscope uh, and the signal was really, really low and they had to increase the, the, the lasers and whatever, high background, uh, shitty images, etc. Sometimes I was so lucky to alert to the microscope uh, and having a good signal and then having tons of pictures. And, okay, what can I do with this? Uh, I mean, what is the, the message now that is coming from these pictures? Um, in that moment of desperation, Alessandro decided it was uh, time to read this paper. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, it's a very interesting paper. I think that uh, you should all read. It's not only this paper, there are several that you can read similar to this. Uh, the paper starts, one of the very first sentences uh, is uh, this. Imaging can be thought of as the most direct, and I would add uh, excited, uh, of experiment, you see something, you report what you see. If only things were truly this simple. And this is exactly how I was feeling at that moment, no? So where's the love? Where's the excitement? What happened to this experiment? Okay, so I read this, um, this paper, and the main message that I took home is, uh, Thea, you should start studying. Study the protocols, and uh, study the microscope, uh, study whatever you are doing, because there's not, uh, uh, Ijin Tan, my supervisor in Uppsala, that gave me the, the right protocol and it's working and it's magic and it's love. So it was time to, to set up the, the steps. So this is what I learned. Uh, I learned that this uh, sentence, you see something, you report what you see, is completely wrong. Uh, that maybe, uh, this is what I took home from these uh, years of experience, you carefully prepare your sample, first of all, when you finally have a good, a very, very good sample, it's time to spend time at the microscope, never before, okay? When you have a good sample, you go to the microscope and you see something. When you are in front of your samples and you are looking at the microscope, then you have to understand what you're seeing, okay? Try to understand, you have to measure, you have to quantify what you're seeing, and only then, after that moment, you report to your PI what you're seeing, okay? Never go to your PI before you did all these steps because I'm afraid he will bite you, okay? Uh, so the main, uh, the main suggestion that I can give to all of you is uh, the biggest lesson that I learned working with microscope. Question yourself a lot. What are you seeing, okay? What's the message that your samples is giving to you? And be critic. Okay? and be extremely honest. I know that we are all going to the microscope knowing that we see an EGFP in the cytoplasmography, in the nucleus, and blah, 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 whatever. 
But still, maybe it's different what you're seeing. Maybe the difference that you're seeing is the truth. Maybe not. Maybe yes, have controls. But be critical and be extremely honest. It's really difficult to be critical and honest with ourselves, but do your best. OK, and now let's start with the, <laughs> with the real presentation. And I will speak about sample preparation. These are the critical steps that I would uh, very simply identify uh, when you're working with microscope. You prepare the sample, and then you have acquisition of image and processing of image. David already spoke about it, and uh, you will learn everything about the second and third step during the practical session in the afternoon. During sample preparation session, that is mine, I will talk uh, only about immunofluorescence. And when I speak uh, in, about immunofluorescence, I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but it will be like cell fixed. I never work with tissue, but for whatever question about uh, tissue, okay, immunofluorescence, you, I'm sure that in the audience there are enough people that are experienced to, to answer your, your questions as well. Um, and life cell imaging, I have a little bit of experience also in life cell imaging, so I will try to, to tell you um, whatever I know. Immunofluorescence, let's start with the definition. Don't forget that uh, it's a simple immunological reaction, okay? About an antibody that has to be um, conjugated to a fluorophore and uh, the antigen. So the antibody, well, your aim is to make the antibody able to go inside your cell to recognize your antigen, make the reaction, okay? And then you go and acquire the reaction output. Uh, so, <coughs> study the protocol. The <coughs> easiest, let's say, protocol is made of several steps. There is a fixation, permeabilization, blocking. Uh, you have to incubate with antibodies, choose the right fluorophore. Then you have to choose your mounting media, knowing how to put your mounting media on the cells, and then uh, put a cover lip on the glass uh, and the slide, etc. You have to study every single step of the protocol. No? Most of the laboratory actually have good protocols that mm. are working with standardized experiments. And I'm sure that you can trust uh, your, the postdoc that is giving you the, the, the protocol. But still, study that protocol. Because uh, it might be that one day you will change uh, the antibody, you change the epitope that you have to recognize, uh, you need to change the fluorophore because the new microscope has a different lasers or whatever. And the protocol is changing. And you have to be able to understand your protocol and make the modification required. Okay? So it's complicated. It's a big work. Okay? And when you Google um, and you find uh, this kind of question, can anyone suggest a good immunofluorescence <coughs> protocol for HEC? I start like uh, getting stressed, and this is more or less the reaction that I have. <laughs> okay. To be fair, the person here actually had some more details and at least asked for specific cell line, okay? But it's terrible. Never go on Google and say, immunofluorescent protocol. Yes, thanks. <laughs> you want to save your time, but you're actually wasting a lot of time, okay? So take your protocol, open your protocol, and try to identify whatever you need um, to, to, to start your immunofluorescent. Um, I add the adding. Uh, another step at the beginning that is uh, never consider when you download from Google uh, uh, immunofluorescent protocol, that is the starting material. And uh, I mean a lot of things for starting material. Uh, I would say the general rules is uh, check that you have all the reagents and instruments you need before starting your experiment, okay? Don't start an experiment in which you need uh, something super resolution, and guess what? In your institute, there's not a super resolution microscope, OK? Uh, or don't start an experiment uh, trusting that the other PhD student left you an aliquote uh, of the precious Alexa fluor 488, because maybe there's not. OK, so check before that you have all the reagents. These are like little stupidities, but I promise you, in the 90% of cases, People are running around laboratory saying, oh, who can lend me two microliters of antibody because uh, the guy finished, etc." So check that you have all the reagents you need and that you have the controls you need because we already listen from other people that controls are extremely uh, important, okay? Essential, I would say. Uh, check exactly that you have a primary, second antibody, nothing solution, whatever. Check that you have the right microscope to see what you have to see. 
and uh, check with the specialist of your institute if you are trained enough to use that microscope, okay? Mm -hmm. If you are not, uh, plan a session in which the specialist can teach you or plan an appointment with the specialist that will acquire the picture with you, okay? Don't improvise yourself and go around in Microsoft facility during the weekends and uh, try to use a microwave and be destroyed the microscope, okay? That is uh, something that we, we know it can happen. <laughs> already happened, but it's okay. Uh, and uh, if the specialist uh, has no time this week, uh, because uh, maybe he's on holiday, good for him, uh, is your chloroform stable enough to wait for your specialist to come back and acquire the picture with you? So try to think all these uh, little things before putting yourself uh, in uh, immunofluorescent experience. Uh, and then the more practical things, uh, let's start from starting material, I mean also the support. You have to choose the right uh, support for uh, um, your experiments, for your, uh, um, maybe for acquisition. Uh, so you can, there are really every shape, uh, every uh, dimension of supports. The, it can be uh, glass cover slip, it can be multi-well chambers, are really useful if you want to have on the same um, slides, the controls, uh, the conditions, mm -hmm. no? everything. Uh, uh, you can also use a glass bottle, I charge you this. These are usually more used for life cell imaging, but uh, it can be that at the end of your life cell imaging, you want to fix your samples and continue with immunofluorescence. Okay? Uh, what you have to be sure, you have to always check, is the thickness of the cover slip. No? It doesn't matter if uh, you're growing the cells on the cover slip uh, and then you're putting on the slide, or if the, the cover slip is the part that is on the bottom of the chamber. The thickness has to be checked every single time, okay? And uh, usually, from my experience, this uh, most of the um, uh, covers that you have to use uh, are of um, 0 0.17 uh, millimeters, but uh, you can find this information on the objective that you're going to use, okay? It's always written, uh, it's uh, one of the uh, characteristics that, that you can find, uh, easily find. Does your cells uh, need uh, a coating to grow on the glass? If it needs a coating, check that the coating is compatible with uh, immunofluorescence, is compatible with uh, um, live imaging. It might be that some of them uh, are not. So um, literature is full of examples uh, of um, protocols for coating uh, the glass and uh, grow cells on it. Check the one that is better for you. Uh, okay, again, starting material, you have to be sure uh, that your cells are healthy. Okay? You don't want a uh, uh, not healthy population of cells because uh, what, which are the information that you will obtain from cells that are going to die. Okay? Uh, and you can easily see in the bright field microscope that you have in your cell culture room before starting the fixation, primarization, everything, uh, you can easily see signs of cellular stress that are usually like cells with, mm, they are multinucleate, uh, there are vacuoles in the cytoplasm, you will see like blood beam membranes. Uh, so at that moment you should stop and decide, should I repeat, uh, should I continue? Stop a moment and decide. Uh, cell density is also really important and it's probably not very considered at the time. Um, if the population of the cell is uh, less confluent, uh, then it will be really difficult to find cells. When you arrive to the microscope, it might be that you cannot find cells because there are only five on your glass, okay? And it's not representative of any experiment to analyze only a few cells. Uh, if the cells are overconfluent, uh, then uh, you might not appreciate the cell architecture or uh, it can give you a higher background, okay, at low magnification. Moreover, I found this uh, interesting example that some protein might exhibit uh, a conference dependent uh, changes in the localization. Here uh, is a YAP protein uh, in green, you can see at low conference, um, the signal is uh, nuclear, but at low, at uh, high conference, uh, the signal is both nuclear and uh, cytoplasmic. So I'm not saying that uh, one is correct and the other is wrong. I don't know because I'm not the owner of this experiment, but you should consider which is the right conference that you need for your experiment because this might change completely the result and you will report uh, a wrong result and you will publish maybe something wrong, okay? Uh, 
Okay, this, uh, I'm not sure this slide is uh, out of topic here or not, but it's a um, personal uh, uh, experience and maybe it's fine to speak about it here. Um, sometimes you're forced uh, to use uh, with the chimeric protein, okay? EGP target protein, flag target protein, because uh, you don't have an antibody that is specific for the protein that you're studying or because uh, it's uh, not working in immunofluorescence, okay? <laughs> so, uh, uh, some years ago, I was studying Rigai, a protein involved uh, in the antiviral response, uh, and I found out that uh, when I infect the cells, uh, okay, with the virus, Rigai is uh, localizing to granules in the cytoplasm that we define as stress granules or antiviral granules, whatever. And you can see uh, cells uh, are uh, and stay fixed and then stay with a primary antibody against the guy and then I use an anti-mouse like a conjugated with an hexafluor for it and uh, I have granules uh, in the cytoplasm and then uh, you know there is this signal in the nucleus it's not really reported that the guy can localize into the nucleus so what is is maybe an a specific signal of the of the of the antibody we don't know moreover we were running down with them uh, with the antibody and they need the flag uh, target guy for IP and whatever else, and say, okay, so from now on, I will start uh, the, to run my immunofluorescence with the flag guy cells. Where are the granules? I never saw the granules anymore, okay? So, and it's just the flag, the, 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 the epitope of tag is what? Uh, how big it is? It's really little, no? But still, it was interacting with my protein in a way that the, the chimeric protein, flag guy, was not behaving anymore as the endogenous, okay? Or as the one that I think is the endogenous because I am able to recognize with a specific primary antibody. But again, other question. <laughs> is this the real protein or not? <laughs> we hope so. Uh, so you have to consider uh, the, these things. And, and the, like the secondary antibody was the same, for example, no? it only changed the, the, the anti-flag fixation, polymerization, everything was exactly the same protocol but I lost the phenotype, okay? Can you imagine what, what you are doing when you use an EGFP protein, flag chimeric protein? So you have to consider, I'm not saying that it's wrong, I'm saying that you have to remember and consider that you are actually checking in an, uh, um, not the endogenous protein. Uh, oh dear, okay, already question, go. <laughs> Another difference between the situations is in one case you overexpress potentially, and the other we do not, right? Yeah. Yes. So if the flag regai somehow has lower affinity for these granules than yeah. the regai, that could be yes. a, an explanation. So mm -hmm. another important thing concept is uh, absolutely. expression levels, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So for all these reasons, again, check carefully, consider or keep in mind what you're doing, okay? Uh, and then we go on with the, with the fixation. We finally have our beautiful cells, we can fix them. For fixing cells, you can choose several uh, reagents, uh, mainly for immunofluorescence are aldehydes and organic solvents. Uh, they have a different way of working. Aldehydes uh, are cross-linking the proteins, while organic solvents um, are preserving your samples by the hydration and protein precipitation. Uh, I want to focus a little bit more on uh, aldehydes because uh, this is the part in which I have more experience about. So uh, usually you have uh, this uh, formaldehyde that is soluble in water and form uh, theoretically short uh, polymers. Okay. We, I, I, I was also kind of confused uh, about this, all this formaldehyde, formalin, paraformaldehyde, what is what? My conclusion <laughs> for what I study they're mainly very similar, okay? Uh, the basic uh, is the aldehyde groups that uh, forms uh, polymers, okay? Formaldehyde is soluble in water and you will have uh, uh, shorter polymers of formaldehyde in number of like four, uh, maybe eight uh, uh, units of formaldehyde. Paraformaldehyde is the power, okay, that we have in the lab that is extremely toxic and you have to uh, solubilize, uh, dissolve in, um, in, uh, in water you have to heat and you have uh, to, to treat with pH to make it uh, um, soluble. Uh, at the end of all this, uh, the principle uh, is, is the same. They are cross-linking proteins, so they are forming bridges okay, between, uh, uh, between proteins. 
What is important that you have always to keep in mind when you are working with uh, um, paraformalia TFA uh, is that uh, uh, it tends, uh, once in solution, the formaldehyde groups to form long chains, long polymers. The longest uh, is your polymer, the more difficult it will be to penetrate the protein and forming the bridges and forming the cross-linking okay, between sites in the protein. This means uh, that uh, long polymers uh, uh, gives you a bad uh, fixation. Bad fixation, don't even waste your time to continue and go to the microscope and everything. Uh, how you avoid this? Uh, you have to prepare your fresh uh, TFA. Uh, what we do in the lab, the little trick is that you prepare your stock, big stock of PFA because you are uh, strong <laughs> consumers of <laughs> PFA, and uh, you store uh, at minus 20, okay? Uh, in small uh, aliquots. So when I need uh, 2 ml of PFA only to fix my sample, I defreeze that, I heat, I'm sure that it's very well dissolved, and then uh, I use. If there is some leftover, I can even keep in the fridge for a few days. I would say once uh, the rules was like not more than one week, I think that is uh, slowly, slowly going down. I would say two days. Okay, uh, if you have all the PFA in the fridge, don't use it. Just uh, throw it in the chemical. Okay. And what about the commercial ones in which they write that you can throw it? Okay, the commercial one, uh, that's another thing. Uh, usually mm. what companies do, they add methanol mm. to preserve uh, the uh, formaldehyde to form long polymers. Uh, so you will be sure that uh, it contains uh, short polymers, but uh, you have to remember that it contains methanol, and methanol can precipitate uh, some proteins. So it can be very good for some... Uh, for some uh, experiments for sometimes uh, for some kind of fixation but if it does uh, try a different way of fixing it okay. uh, so the pro I think I already more or less say these things okay it's a fast uh, penetration and the cons uh, is that uh, as a slow reaction so you have to allow PFA to fix uh, your protein especially if you're working with tissue and I'm sure that uh, in that case for my head, it needs much more time no? Uh, it's a pH sensitive, so you have to dissolve the, the, the PFA in buffers. You have to be sure that in the moment that uh, your PFA is touching your precious samples, the cells, uh, is the right pH. Uh, because if it's extremely acid, you can imagine that the cells will not be really nice at the end of the fixation. Okay? Uh, it has a low degree of antigen masking, so it, it's good. Uh, it's a good fixative for uh, whoever is doing in situ hybridization because it, it can cross link uh, protein protein but also protein DNA. So uh, it preserves uh, that. Um, Contrary is a slow reaction, uh, it can uh, bleed being effect on the cell membranes, identification vacuoles. I guess this depends much more from the pH of your PFA, right? Uh, thanks for helping. Keep doing like this, please. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's not cross-linking lipids, so if you have to study uh, lipid uh, structure, uh, you have to be sure of which fixative is better for you. Uh, and please remember always, we keep forgetting in the lab, PFA is toxic, okay? So when you have to prepare a big stock, uh, prepare it under the hood. If you have to boil PFA, find a way to bring the heater under the hood. Or you prepare a small falcon, okay, and you boil it inside the falcon. But find a way to protect yourself and your colleagues. Uh, the most of the time, don't know that you are preparing BFA, okay? Pro protect uh, the environment uh, around you from, uh, from from all these toxic reagents. Uh, critical factors for fixation that you have to remember that you have to set up, okay, for every for every protocol. Uh, time, temperature, osmolarity, pH. Uh, mm -hmm. Time and temperature are really related between them. Uh, okay. Uh, you can fix for a few minutes, uh, for overnight, for days, depends. Okay, depends on what you need to see, what you need to fix. Uh, temperature, again, 37 degree, room temperature, 4 degree. You have to set up your protocol and find uh, which is the best way of uh, fixing. 
uh, osmolarity and pH, as I already told you, um, PFA has to be diluted in a, in a buffer, PBS, PEM, we use PEM in the lab, uh, but be sure that uh, you have the right pH, the back fixation is a pH between 6 and 8, we suggest 7, okay, 7, 7.2 is the best probably. Uh, and here is just a little example about the um, uh, time of fixation, no? how it can change drastically the, 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 the results. Uh, one minute of fixation and you barely see just the host, okay? Uh, but then you increase the, the time of fixation and you start having beautiful signal from your antibody. The, the cells were just fixed for different times and treated with the same antibody, the same process, everything. And then if you go over the time of fixation, you start masking probably the antigens and you don't see anything else anymore, the antibody is not able to recognize the, the, the antigens. Uh, okay, so the other kind of fixation uh, is um, with organic solvents. I'm speaking about ethanol, methanol, acetone. Um, uh, the, the, the pro is that uh, it's really fast, it's probably faster than uh, PFA, than formaldehyde and PFA. It doesn't need permeabilization because uh, uh, they work like by the hydrogen, um, the hydrogenation and precipitation of protein and it removes uh, the lipids, okay? Most of the lipids, big part of the lipids are gone. Uh, so you don't need to permeabilize after this, uh, after this step of fixation. So of course it's saving time. Uh, it uh, gives you a good preservation of cell architecture. I know that is the best method that you can use if you're studying cytoskeleton mm -hmm. or uh, histones also, so for big, uh, big, big uh, structure, big proteins, I would say. While remember that is a, a definitely a bad uh, way for fixing your cells if uh, you are studying small uh, soluble uh, proteins because uh, they will go away with the washing after the fixation, okay? The biggest risk, uh, you have to remember that uh, uh, methanol is uh, denaturating proteins. Uh, so um, you are risking to denaturate the antigen as well. And the risk uh, is uh, that if you are working with uh, EGFP target proteins uh, or just EGFP, you want to see EGFP in your cells, uh, you are denaturating EGFP, you can imagine what happened, okay? Bye bye fluorescence. So, uh, consider always choose the best fixative uh, way. These are just few examples, just uh, uh, cells were uh, here fixed in a different way and then uh, uh, treated with the same uh, antibodies. You can see that, for example, methanol was good for keratin while the formaldehyde didn't allow probably at all the, the recognition of the, the entrance. Um, here, I guess the, the, the difference is drastic, okay? You lose completely the signal. So I, I don't want to enter in the details of uh, this example because uh, as you can see, these are not my experiment, but uh, uh, different cells, different target needs a different fixation, okay? And you have to study which is the best for you. Uh, I want to say just a few words about fluorescence now. Um, so it's a phenomenon where materials, including tissues and cells, emit a background, what we call background, the hated background, is a background fluorescence in the absence of uh, any experimental fluorophores, okay? I want to speak about this now because of course you have the natural molecules uh, in uh, mammalian cells that can emit uh, some, uh, some fluorescence and for that uh, there's there are things that you can do, but definitely the thing that you can do is uh, uh, remember that your fixed, okay, can induce uh, out fluorescence. Um, because of the reaction of the aldehydes in the in the in your in your samples, if you have free aldehydes, it can give you a specific uh, uh, recognition of uh, um, of your antibody or uh, uh, a specific autofluorescence. Okay, uh, what you can do mainly to check the autofluorescence of your sample is working with controls. Okay, always have controls. Uh, I took this uh, slide with the permit of Grandolfo that did this lesson last year. Uh, it was a great lesson. <laughs> and uh, she, this is an example of uh, her student that uh, show her this uh, uh, um, tissue fixed and then treated with a primary against some nuclear protein and then a second antibody. And she looked at this picture and uh, so, okay, so maybe you are having a lot of autofluorescence because I don't believe what is this. And she asked him to um, repeat the experiment 
with the controls. Controls means uh, avoid the antibodies, okay? So when he removed the, from the protocol the incubation with the primary antibody, this is what he got, okay? It's the same, do you agree, right? And then uh, she asked to remove also the secondary antibody, okay? So I guess the student has some troubles in repeating the, <laughs> the experiment other times uh, and demonstrate to her that he was able to, to get the, the, the right uh, signal. Uh, this actually we should uh, always do in every immunofluorescence or at least uh, at the initial of your experiment, no? at, the, at the beginning step of your experiment, like when you're still setting the, uh, the cell line, the fixation method, the, the antibody, the primary, secondary, always work with control. <coughs> always have one backup uh, glass that you will not treat with your, uh, with your primary and secondary. Okay, so that you will know at least uh, where is the autofluorescence, which kind of autofluorescence you have, and then you can start considering the real signal. Okay, uh, methods to counteract for autofluorescence, thanks God uh, they exist. So use fresh PFA is the first thing that uh, we can suggest you. Um, you can uh, add in your protocol a step in which you treat your samples with glycine that. Uh, goes and feed the, the, the free aldehyde groups uh, in your samples, reducing the uh, reaction of the aldehydes uh, in, in a specific way, you have to choose your best floral force. For example, in, in the example of this student, the autofluorescence was uh, in the green channel, okay? So the rule is uh, the redder is better. If you know that you have some autofluorescence, use uh, a secondary antibody conjugated with uh, Alexa 594 or something else uh, that is uh, uh, giving you uh, emission in the red spectra, I would say, okay, from there on. Um, you can always also use uh, some chemicals that are, uh, uh, I found this, uh, this uh, that I never used. To be honest, but I found that there are in literature several uh, mm -hmm. uh, papers that uh, explain the difference between one chemicals and the others that are able to reduce uh, um, autofluorescence. Uh, this is one, it was uh, really nice, and they tested different uh, chemicals to, to see wh which one was uh, better to reduce. I don't remember even which, which tissue it was. Um, some people suggest to play with UV light because UV light might. Um, uh, decrease uh, the autofluorescence, I guess it's working kind of a bleaching, no? Okay, thanks, keep doing that, <laughs> okay? And, uh, uh, but I also read that uh, several times it's not working, so you can try, but uh, I'm not sure it will work. Uh, and then you can play with acquisition, that is something that uh, I hate, I usually don't mm -hmm. like to to play too much uh, with acquisition just to make a signal disappear. So we can arrive to the microscope with a, the, the, the best setup signals, and then in case uh, you play with acquisition, only, only if you know what you are doing, only if you have been teach and trained on how to do this, right? Keep doing like this. <laughs> Good. Uh, okay, critical steps. Uh, again, uh, permeabilization. After fixation, we have to permeabilize. Why we have to permeabilize? Because we have to allow the antibody to reach the antigen, if the antigen is inside the cell, okay? But uh, if the antigen is uh, on the cell surface, uh, and you don't need to permeabilize. So be sure of uh, what you need. Don't follow the protocol that the postdoc gives you that say permeabilize with triton if you have to see some uh, receptor on, uh, on, the, on the cell membrane, okay? Because it might be that then your antibody will enter and will bind in a specific place, so uh, uh, be sure. Um, okay, so it's not needed if the antigen is on the plasma membrane, it's not needed also, as we said before, if uh, you fix uh, your cells uh, with a solvent, organic solvent, okay? Uh, there are different um, kind of uh, permeabilizer, mild permeabilizing and strong permeabilizing. Uh, permeabilizer. Mm -hmm. um, the mild are like digitonin and saponin. Uh, they are kind of inefficient <coughs> to um, permeabilize the nuclear membrane, so avoid this one if you are studying some histones or other uh, factors in the nucleus. Um, and they are inefficient because they selectively remove uh, cholesterol, if I'm not wrong. 
uh, strong, uh, the th uh, strong um, permeabilizer, uh, like uh, detergents like uh, Triton, MP40, Twin20. Uh, and these are even able to break a protein lipid interaction and protein protein interaction also as well. So, again, one more time. You can also fix it uh, with aldehyde and then permeabilize with solvents, okay? If it's required from, for your protocol, there are some uh, examples of this in literature why it's better to fix it with one, one, one method and then uh, uh, permeabilize with solvents. Uh, again, I want to always report <laughs> examples. Um, same cells, okay? Uh, fix it in the same way, permeabilize with uh, methanol, permeabilize with triton. You see that you lose the signal from the actin. Well, it's really weak, and you completely lose the signal for a PBI because the PBI was not able to reach uh, its antigen, okay? <coughs> this, uh, I'm really sorry, I forgot when I put this picture. Um, so I forgot also the details, let's say, but <laughs> the, the point uh, was this. Uh, your antigen is uh, very well recognized uh, when you fix with paraformaldehyde and then you use methanol for, per, uh, for permeabilization, okay? So your antibody is able to enter and bind on cytoskeleton, something. Uh, if you choose the wrong uh, permeabilizer, okay? It might be that the, uh, your antibody is not able to enter and it brings you to false results. Like this, it looks like the antibody was trying hard to enter and penetrate the membrane and it just stopped there. So what you will conclude? That the signal is on the cell surface, okay? Or, or what? Because it looks like that, it was not able to enter. So choose the right permeabilization based on your target. Uh, blocking solution, uh, there are several uh, agents that you can use. We all know why we have to block, but uh, we repeat, uh, we need to reduce the background signal caused by non-specific binding of the primary and the secondary antibodies, okay? You can use uh, BSA, casein, milk, FBS, or you can also use the serum of the um, animal species uh, in which uh, your antibody was uh, uh, raised, okay? Uh, but uh, never use the serum of uh, the animal species in which your primary antibody was raised. Otherwise, we'll just see a beautiful lamp, okay, instead of a cell. <laughs> um, good to include uh, sometimes glycine if you want to, to feed more your uh, um, your samples with uh, glycine in order to have less uh, free aldehyde groups uh, or uh, uh, detergent because uh, um, I usually had the detergents both in the washes and uh, in, the, um, in the blocking. It's competing for the hydrophobic interaction uh, between the proteins and antibodies so it's, it's always good. Okay, now uh, we are finally at the point of uh, antibody and uh, fluorophores. Uh, here is the moment in which we can uh, distinguish between a uh, different kind of immunofluorescence, direct, indirect, and combined. Um, uh, we, we more or less know everybody how it works. I want to stop just on the advantages of one, is that uh, it might be more rapid because it's a single step, okay, staining, and uh, also you can use uh, uh, different antibodies that were raised in the same host. So sometimes you have uh, Two antibodies, both of them are raising mouse. Uh, what you can do, just the, uh, just the direct, okay? Uh, about the rapidity, I guess it depends if you're buying already conjugated uh, uh, primary antibody or if you, if you have to labor yourself because then it can uh, take some time. So if you want to do in the lab, because it can be delicate, and if you don't have a proper protocol, you have to set up that also. So. Okay, uh, no signal amplification uh, from uh, the secondary. Ah, uh, yes, one antibody by the antigen. Uh, and this already said. Okay, so the, why the indirect? Because uh, you have amplification of the signal, okay? Uh, you have the primary binding to the antigen and many secondary can bind to the, to the primary. So you have a big amplification. Um, uh, it's longer, so you have two steps staining and uh, it requires antibodies from different hosts. Please, before starting the incubation with your secondary antibody, check the host of the primary, check the host of the secondary. Avoid the cross-reactivity of uh, antibody, okay? And I'm speaking even between uh, secondary and secondary. 
okay? Uh, check every time that you don't have the um, same animals uh, cost, let's say. And also uh, try to don't mix uh, goat and uh, sheep ultimately because it looks like that evolution didn't differentiate enough these uh, two animals. So <laughs> you can have some cross-reactivity as well. Uh, uh, characteristic that you have to consider about the uh, fluorophores, okay, that you conjugate to your antibody. Uh, we speak a lot uh, about excitation and emission spectra. Is the, actually the most important thing that you have to consider. There are some uh, um, characteristics that evaluate the efficiency of your fluorophore that you have to consider. And uh, I would start uh, with uh, considering really practical things. How it was conserved in the lab? Was the people using before you, using carefully? Okay, did you use carefully last time? Are you sure it's still fluorescent? So, uh, working concentration, okay? And the time that you need to incubate, the temperature that you need for uh, the incubation, all these uh, easy things. Then uh, we go on uh, with the more complicated part. Uh, we already speak uh, a lot about what is the uh, excitation <laughs> spectra and emission spectra. I just want uh, to repeat uh, one more time, avoid uh, spectra <laughs> overlap, okay? Never, never, never use uh, two fluorophores that both uh, have uh, emission in the, in the same, uh, in the same um, wavelength because you will not see the difference, okay? Uh, to do this, uh, there are several uh, um, programs online that you can uh, use uh, to analyze the, your fluorophore and uh, the, their spectra. Uh, I started a long time ago uh, using the spectra viewer from Time Fisher that I can promise you it's really for dummies. Okay? It's really easy to use. And uh, there are many others that are more... Uh, not complicated, but I would say more detailed. Like you can really um, add the filters uh, and uh, write exactly the characteristic of the filters or of the lamp that you're going to use. Here you just have uh, like, okay, fluorophores. You have, of course, it's time official, so you have all the list of fluorophores that you can find. Uh, mm -hmm. Light sources or a lamp or, um, or, uh, or lasers. And then excitation filters and emission filters, I see that they just list the uh, fit, uh, twist, uh, CY5. So if you need uh, to set up uh, your immunofluorescence, knowing that your microscope has specific <coughs> fields, blah, 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 use other programs. But this is a good starting point, okay? Yes, Alessandro said it was on DICE uh, um, website, there is one. So find the one that you like more. They are for free, they are easy, and they are online. There's no excuses, use it. Uh, the efficiency of the fluorophore. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, something that uh, I promise you, you will not find uh, so easily in the description of the fluorophore from Thermo Fisher or whoever wants to sell you the fluorophore. But keep in mind that you should know, okay? Uh, the extinction coefficient, so the capacity of like absorption at a specific wavelength that is, mm, you can design with the, with, with the, with the, with the excitation <coughs> and emis emission spectra. Uh, fluorescent quantum yield, so the number of fluorescent photons that your uh, fluorophore is able to emit uh, per number of excitation photons that your fluorophore is absorbing, okay? And uh, lifetime, so the time a fluorophore spends in the excited state before emitting a photon and returning to ground state. Um, photo bleaching, we spoke about this also this morning. There is an high intensity illumination that can cause the fluorophore to change its structure. Okay, so it's a real change in the structure, it's something that you don't recover, uh, and it can uh, uh, no longer fluoresce. Okay, here is a nice example of uh, both fluorophores, so I guess they choose the worst one, because after five seconds of exposure, <laughs> it was already completely disappeared. But I mean, it's a strong example, but this is what can happen when you are at the microscope, okay, and you're looking at your sample, it can be that suddenly you don't have the signal anymore. Uh, methods to counter photo bleaching, uh, choose uh, the most robust fluorophore, okay? And how do you choose based on the characteristics that companies will try to don't tell you, but you can find out which are the characteristics. Um, this, I think, is really the, the essential thing, protect your sample. Means uh, from the moment in which you are still on your bench uh, working, Try to don't work with a frontal lamp for speleology not to see better your sample. Try to work with normal light or if nobody is around and uh, you, you can switch off the lights uh, like to reduce uh, the minimum, no? Um, 
then uh, you can, uh, you, of course, once that you are at the microscope, you have to optimize the, the scanning. So short scanning, reduce uh, photo bleaching, reduce the illumination. Don't always work with the lamp at the maximum because uh, so it's more bright and I'm having more fun. No, uh, you're not having fun. You will destroy your sample. Uh, you can reduce the illumination and choose the right detectors. If you know that uh, your fluorophore is not so uh, good, uh, maybe you can try to work with a better <coughs> microscope that SGB bought uh, last year, no? so you will have better detectors, you will uh, have better signal with the same uh, amount of light. Okay? Uh, and of course you can use anti-fade reagents that we already spoke yesterday. They, uh, these are reagents that I think that most of the time uh, you can use uh, directly in the mounting media and uh, it reduces uh, the um, um, photo bleaching when you expose uh, your samples uh, uh, to the light. So now that you know all the characteristics, because now you don't have any excuses, two days that we are speaking about the importance of choosing the fluorophore, if I see somebody say, but I think that color red is nicer, okay, then you, Batman will come and slap you. Because uh, you really have to, to, to choose carefully the, the fluorophores that, uh, that you want to use. Uh, nucleus staining, um, uh, it has, uh, why, why you have to, to stain your nucleus with a, with a dye? Because uh, it helps you uh, finding your cells in a really like, simple words, uh, but it also gives you information about the, the status of your cells. No? It can tell you if the cells are going to mitosis or if they are going to die. Okay, because if the nucleus start breaking, there's not so much to do with the cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as Gianluca was saying this morning, it, it can help in quantification because you can identify all your cells and not counting number of cells uh, in your image. And then out of these cells, uh, you can go and check for your, uh, for your uh, specific signal. Uh, there are several uh, dyes, there are really a lot. I found that there's a word of, uh, of dyes that you can use to stain your nucleus. The most known, I guess, is DAPI, OCHT, and uh, DOT3. Uh, DAPI and OCHT, if somebody knows how to pronounce OCHT, please tell me, because I always have doubts about it. <laughs> but we all understood what I mean, so it's okay. Uh, they have a really similar uh, excitation and emission spectra. Why dot three is uh, um, you need a um, um, far red um, microscope that is able to acquire picture in far red. Okay. Uh, now I'm in the last uh, step of um, immunofluorescence is the mounting media. Okay. Why you have to use because it's displacing the water from your samples and um, it prevents uh, um, the, the polymerization of the, of the cross-linkers, uh, so it protects uh, also from uh, autofluorescence. It matches, uh, this is really important, it matches the refractive index, okay, because the refractive index in your samples has to be similar to the refractive index of the oil, okay, for example, that you have to use, uh, that you have to put between your samples and the objective. Um, it prevents uh, photo bleaching, as we said, uh, because of the anti-fade uh, reagents. It uh, preserves the samples for long-term storage. So, uh, there are different kinds of uh, mounting medium that you can use. There are the most efficient one, that is the one that is hardening by themselves. And uh, uh, they are really, really good for uh, long-term storage of your samples. This is what people said, I never use, but uh, they are really good for this. Uh, but uh, it might be that they are not the best if you have to um, run a 3D analysis of your samples because it can happen, maybe it's a really little difference, but it can make a big difference in microscopy, that while uh, the uh, mountain medium is hardening, the sample gets a little bit flat. Okay? So for 3D reconstruction, maybe it's not the best. The best in that case uh, is the liquid mounting media, but remember that uh, uh, you, you need to seal your samples with, uh, with nail polish. Cover slip, uh, we already spoke about. Uh, here I can skip, it's just uh, how you are supposed to uh, put uh, the, the, the mounting medium and the, the, the glass. Avoid bubbles, that is really important. 
Okay? Uh, image acquisition, I don't want to talk about it because uh, we, we, you will learn everything about uh, the practical, during the practical session, but uh, the questions that you have to question yourself, uh, which microscope I have to use, uh, which objective I have to use, uh, uh, which laser, which filters, we already learned uh, the difference between uh, wide field and confocal. I hope that uh, you don't have doubts about it anymore. If you have, uh, uh, remember that we have the practical session. Alessandro Cometa is always with us during this course to answer about uh, every question about Confoca. Um, magnification also, I sp we spoke a lot. I think that I can go fast because I'm late. Uh, this nobody told you so far, but uh, um, some objectives, only some objectives can work uh, in presence of oil, okay, immersion oil. Never, never, never put an objective that is not supposed to work with oil in oil, because the risk is that you will destroy the objective, and the objective can cost 30, 50,000 euros, or pay attention. No, that's okay. <laughs> I was in the room. <laughs> Consider that it costs 50,000 euros, okay? So you will not destroy it. <laughs> and clean See, exactly. <laughs> and this will destroy the objective. <laughs> exactly. So learn also, ask the specialist from your institute to teach you how to clean the objective at the end of, the, of, your, uh, of your analysis, okay? Always clean the objective properly, okay? Uh, I have a few slides on live imaging. Do I have time to go on? Can I take five minutes? Okay. Um, okay, so live imaging, blah, 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 too fast. Uh, Paola will tell you everything about live imaging this uh, afternoon. I just want to point out that, remember, is an invasive technique and you need uh, controls, okay? Because uh, you are, uh, if you don't have controls, how are you sure that what you are <laughs> recording in your live imaging is uh, a real biological process or is due to the uh, radiation that you're putting on your live cells. Mm. Because cells, of course, are not happy to be illuminated. Right? <laughs> uh, there are, you have to work with uh, imaging chambers. Uh, so they are actually like, uh, plas like the normal plastics that you use in the lab, but there's a bottom uh, glass uh, cover slip. Actually, some of them are not glass, but special plastic with special polymers that, you, that are good for um, 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 opticals. Okay. Um, various shape, size, quality, uh, and prices, of course. <laughs> and uh, it's always nice to have uh, these kind of chambers because on the same uh, small uh, slide, you can have all your treatments and also your controls, okay? Um, in live imaging, uh, you always have to take care of your samples. The, the main objective uh, that you have to keep in mind during your live imaging experiment is that you want to keep uh, your cells uh, alive, and not only alive, also healthy, okay? as much as you can. So you have to control the temperature, uh, and you are doing with the incubator, the atmosphere. Again, the incubator, there are several kinds, stage incubator or cage incubator. Um, and you, uh, you, based on the kind of experiment uh, you have to do, you have to choose the, the right uh, incubator because this is really small, so it's more difficult to keep the, the temperature and the, and the atmosphere inside. Uh, but I'm sure that these things Paul already explained you yesterday during the course, practical, yeah, good. Uh, medium, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Theoretically, okay, you should use exactly the same medium that you're using in cell culture in order to be sure that uh, you are <coughs> able to reproduce uh, your uh, experiment as it will happen in the safe incubator of cell culture. The truth uh, is that uh, you should avoid fennel red because uh, it can give you a high background. You can add the herpes in order to control the CO2 um, um, levels, but uh, herpes can make the cells growing slowly, or it can be sometimes phototoxic for some cells. So again, you have to, to pay attention. And more important, you have to be careful to the amount of media that you are using. In these little chambers, uh, you usually put uh, like 200 microliter of media, and maybe you want to run uh, the, your analysis for 48 hours, 72 hours, days and days and weeks, and meantime, it evaporated, and uh, what happened to your cells if the media evaporate? Uh, 
so all these things have to be um, set up as well as the light because the light can damage your cells. Cells are never happy to be illuminated even with the in bright field okay if you put uh, the lamp at the maximum and you're not even using fluorophore that by itself it can be phototoxic for the cell uh, they will produce uh, rose free radicals and they will uh, will have a lot of trouble in being alive during the your experiment but i will skip this i just want to this is my last slide is uh, coming from my first experience uh, at the time lapse microscopy when we were really excited we just bought the microscope it started everything from uh, fixed samples, okay, in which uh, essentially what I wanted to see is the translocation of my uh, GFP signal from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. It was really easy in fixation. We saw many cells doing this. You will not trust from this picture, but I trust you other pictures, 100% <laughs> of cells translocate. And then we went to the um, live imaging, <coughs> okay, and uh, and uh, I put the cells, I set up the microscope, and then I was hoping to be like at the cinema. And this is my movie. Okay, and now it's going on and on. Do you see any translocation? Okay, I promise there is one. Okay, it's here. And uh, I don't see any translocation, but what you can appreciate, okay, is a shift in the x, y axis, okay, at a certain point of the movie. And it's not because all my population of cells decide to jump suddenly another point, but it's because we were so excited that we went there during the acquisition and we accidentally pushed the table, okay? <laughs> so all our samples moved a little bit. And what you can see is also photo blitzing, okay? Because by the end of the, of the, of the movie, my signal was going down, the background was going up and the many cells start dying, okay? So this was my very, very first experience. And again, one more time, we learned that uh, it's not uh, like watching a nice movie. It requires a lot of time, a lot of studies, a lot of setup, okay? Uh, I can suggest you interesting readings, uh, seeing is believing, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, also called the black box, and uh, several websites uh, that you can use. Uh, um, they are full of tutorials. Uh, Zeiss Campus, Microscopy U, Imaging It, and the uh, website of Thermo Fisher, but uh, also others can give you many tutorials on how to use their product, but the theory behind is the same for every product, okay? And also, please, start filling your uh, uh, Facebook uh, with uh, nice uh, pages, like I love microscopy, it's like microscopy, and Nichols World War, that is giving you many nice pictures of uh, uh, microscopy every day. And that's all. Thanks.